Hello everybody, everybody interested in SEDA and welcome to this number six lecture in our se uh, program series of SEDA, History, Craft and Modern Practice. My name is Annette Hust and I'm part of uh, Scandinavian Center for Shamanic Studies and uh, the research, the study and the teaching of both SEDA and uh, Old Nordic magic uh, tradition has really been like the essence, my speciality for the past 30 years or something. And so um, uh, today the, the title of, uh, of our lecture is uh, the relationship to spirits and nature beings and gods, both in Old uh, Norse magic and in our modern state of today. Um, we will first look at, see what we can learn from the old written sources. Um, uh, learn about the relationships between humans, both those who practiced uh, magic and other people, between them and this, the many kinds of spirit beings that populated, should we say, the old Norse world. And maybe some of those that you have met in the, in the mythology, in the Norse mythology. Um, yeah, we will first look at that, uh, see what we can learn from the sources, and then we will also uh, briefly, but it's important, look at what the, what has a thousand years of uh, monotheism, of Christian culture, uh, how has that affected our relation, the human relationship to those spirits, especially the spirits of nature. And then we will uh, turn to today and explore a more, should we say, um, shamanic or animistic relationships with, uh, with the spirits, how, uh, the way it has been known in shamanic cultures all over the world, and which I also feel is the most relevant and giving for, um, for doing our modern seder and other shamanic practices that involve the spirit world. Um, including we, including this is also to take a, a look at the challenges of things like um, embodiment, about control, protection, and uh, a modern idea about uh, only working with so-called uh, um, compassionate uh, spirits. So there is a legacy here for us to learn about. And then for each of us to, to find out what is now helpful and appropriate and relevant for us to use in our practice today. If people haven't heard much about, should we say, Old, Norse mythology, old Nordic mythology, uh, then at least they have probably heard about uh, Odin and Freya, the gods there, and maybe they have also heard about Valkyria. Uh, the Valkyrias and the Norns, uh, at least. Um, but actually, what we're going to dive into in a little while, it's this, um, it's this myriad of different kinds of spirits and beings um, that is populating both uh, the land and the, the different spirit worlds and interrelating with human beings in all kinds of ways. And in order to, in order to grasp that, so to speak, and hear it for what it is, we also have to remember that most of us are brought up in a culture uh, with a thousand years of um, monotheism. And it is sort of in our bones, or at least in our or almost an unconscious uh, way of dealing with uh, especially things like spirits. This is quite understandable. And I just say this um, to, should we say, call for that we're extra alert uh, in when and examine uh, our expectations to how different kinds of spirits are supposed to behave or what value they might have. Uh, and how they interact with us. It's very easy to, um, should we say, import 
this uh, worldview that we have, that our culture has trained us in, in all kinds of ways, to import that into the way we listen to or experience the uh, stories about the old uh, spirit worlds. And um, for example, thereby uh, focusing only on a few uh, uh, famous gods, for example, Odin and Freya. Um, and, and also there can be a tendency to, to, um, to if there are mentioned, uh, for, for example, gods and, and giants and elves and whatnot, then to, to, to put them, to list them in a hierarchy. And where, of course, every, there are, I've seen so many also scholarly work where these listings are, should we say, of course, the gods, the godheads, they are on top, they are the best and the finest. And then comes a whole list of different kind of spirit beings. And uh, the further we get down to the ground, so to speak, to the earth, the more that I've even seen an expression like uh, used for this as lower mythology. And that's where you meet the land Vetir and the Jotnar and the elves and the dwarves. And um, this, as I said, this is understandable given our history. But uh, I work from a shamanic point of view, and uh, which is, should we say, more or less uh, built on an animistic um, worldview that I'll get back to a little bit later. But, but for now, it's, it's uh, that there's a, it's a more, it's almost political correct, you know, more inclusive view of uh, all kinds of spirit beings. So, when I now start this intro into this, uh, to, to, to try to give you uh, about this huge, diverse population of uh, spirit beings of all kinds, I am going to present them in a different way than on a list from top to bottom. Uh, it is only a construction. It's, I mean, it's another construction, it's another system, so please hold on to it lightly. But uh, here we go. I hope it's helpful. Yes, so here is, should we say, my play with trying to, to make another kind of mapping or overview over this multiple invisible population. Um, and I should also say I have chosen some, some uh, should we say, kinds of spirits or spirits uh, names and it's not comprehensive. It's just what I've felt is, is helpful here. Um, so instead of we have a list, I've, I've chosen to show like, uh, to, to group um, the spirit beings into three sort of yeah, groups or families. And just to give uh, these here are the ones that are linked with uh, nature. And these here, are the ones that are more linked with uh, human beings or even families. And then these are those you uh, know about as gods. Um, I can just, uh, I've written the, the Norse uh, words in, uh, in blue and in English you have the, the uh, uh, yeah, the English names. So if we just start over here, I'll just to do it very briefly. Uh, giants that we know in the text as, as Jotnar and Thurs, and then uh, dwarves and many kind of land spirits. Some of them are called Landvetir. Uh, some are mound dwellers, some are rock dwellers, and uh, they could, for example, be called Bergbur. Uh, and then we have all what you also may rem know from uh, all kinds of other folk traditions, what we could uh, um, put together in, in the term the hidden folks. There can be uh, both uh, Huldra, um, that's called Huldufolk, in one area of Scandinavia and or in, in more eastern parts it's called Vitra. And uh, in Swedish some of these guys are called Tomte. Um, and elves. In, in Norse it's called Alva or Alva. And we can translate that both to elves and, and fairies. Um, now, that's just this group here. 
those over here, I would say a lot of them often have functions in relationship to, to human beings that some of that you could call uh, guardian spirits or even tutelary spirits as a teaching spirits. And uh, you know some of them, like, like Valkyrdia, who also have the, the function on the Val, on the battleground, uh, choosing the dead ones. And, um, and, uh, and Fylgjur and Hamingjur are more, you would say, related to a family or a person as their uh, lifelong uh, spirit guide. Um, Norns we also hear as some sometimes uh, having a, should we say, an, an influence on the, on human uh, fate that uh, is uh, equivalent with, with the gods, sort of to say it very roughly. I don't want to offend anybody here. Um, in of the down here in the, well, I guess it was to challenge our 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 should we say our usual view that I, I put the the group of God at the bottom just to get you dizzy. Um, we have the family, uh, the God family of the Vanir, and we have the family of the Asia. And, and those you probably first would know would be Njord of the sea and the lake and the Freya of fertility and love and Frey as fertility, God of fertility, and a lot of others that has not made it uh, into the stories that we know today. A lot of others. And amongst the Aesir, you know especially Thor, Odin and Freak. There are also many others. What I think is especially interesting on this image here, or this way of trying to, to see it, is where they overlap, where it's not clear where it's going to be hard um, to put them and keep them in a category because they are sort of beyond that, they transcend that. And, and one is especially maybe the Desir, because they are known sometimes as goddesses, um, operating in a collective, a collective um, connected with Freya, sometimes. And other times they are seen as the guardian spirits. And in one story, uh, the same um, female guardian spirit to a family or a person could be called a Fylgjö Kona, that is a, a following woman, or uh, a Desir and sometimes also Valkyria. Um, and also sometimes there has even been talked uh, about land Desir, meaning that some Desir actually um, were connected or linked to a certain place in nature. They're also called Spa Desir, meaning those spirits that can uh, help you with uh, foreseeing the future. We will get back to another one of, of that kind uh, later. And then there is this uh, general word for spirits to Gand that I have put here in the middle, and not to forget the ancestors who uh, can play roles in all these areas. If we, if we think about now some of those people we met uh, in, in our earlier lectures, is, for example, Thorbjörg Lidlvulva, who did the, the Seid, um, to bring back, uh, um, let's we see, fertility and prosperity to this uh, to this village that was uh, uh, damaged by uh, illness and barrenness. It was said that um, many uh, many spirits came, and the word used there is not here because it's a Latin name, naturur, meaning natures or nature beings of some sort. And uh, they were, so we could wonder who would they be? Would they be the local land spirits that she needed to negotiate with? Or would they be some of her own uh, spirits? Maybe her Fylke. Or um, the, the, the scholar Hilda Davidson, uh, amongst others probably, 
also speculate or think that the Thorbjörg Little William may be connected with or associated or uh, with Frey, the, the fertility god. And uh, which would be sort of smart if she is sent out to know about when will new uh, fruitfulness return to the village. And this is where I really like to point out that we have Frey here amongst, solidly placed amongst the gods. But if I may say it this way, Frey couldn't be Frey without the elves, without the alpha. And um, sometimes, uh, it, I think it's both in the poems Völuspor and in other mythical poems that when you would expect in a line that they said Aesir and Vanir, instead they say Aesir and Alvar, Alfar. So there is not this, should we say, um, border between who are the God beings and who are the elf beings as we are brought up to think. They are sort of together. Um, so in, in, in the case of Thorbjörg Lillevølve, then if she is associated with Frey, then you could also speculate that some of the spirit beings that she wants to uh, or needs help from in order to do her job may be the elves, the alpha of that area. Um, I think there's a, we, we could talk about somebody else or just to mention, or should I say anchor this sort of theoretical stuff with some of what you've heard before. You remember uh, probably I talked about Thuriot, Sundfuliot, who used Said to bring back a, a fish, or some, some place it is even said herring, into a fjord they had um, disappeared from. And I would think it would be rather likely in this respect that she would call upon Njord, the god Njord, um, who takes care of both ships and sea and lakes. Um, we had also the story of uh, Hadelgrim and his spear axe that he did cite in order to that only that one and no one else should be his ever be his bane. And I think it could have been Odin there uh, that he might have contacted. Or somebody that we don't even know. Maybe someone, a local spirit being or a local god that he was uh, having already a strong relationship with. Yeah, that is a sort of these uh, a few examples for you to sort of just put some meat on these uh, bones here. Um, now, uh, if you could imagine that you look at this picture, and then all of a sudden all these uh, these borders have disappeared, then maybe it's more, should we say, maybe more like how I experience it anyway. And if, when you look at all these names here and say, okay, so what's a rock dweller? And when is it really a huldufolk? Or should we rather call it an elf? Then at all these names, and if it that makes you dizzy and you think, oh, then I'll just forget about the whole thing, all these names, then we are getting there because then we come to what's a more, should we say, a timeless way of relating with the spirit is, is firsthand. That we, we will meet them as face to face and then they will tell us what, uh, what their agenda is, what their concern is, what they want from us, what they can help us with. And uh, in that way, really start a relationship especially with uh, what we could uh, could call land spirits in, in general, uh, mostly up in this area here of my map, then we will need to, uh, to talk a little more about it because they are the ones, should we say, who have been, um, it's been hardest to, there's been more challenges 
to our good neighbor relations between us humans and, and the nature spirits than between others. And uh, so in a little while we'll go out and uh, uh, hear a good story about such a relationship. But um, first I'll say here is, this is a map. All kinds of maps are just an aid that sort of helps you to get a starting overview over the land you want to, you could say, take into possession. And uh, when you sort of grasp what the general lines of the map and you know which way to go, that's when you put the map in your back pocket and then you go out and firsthand embrace the world. That's what we're going to do now. Here we are again, out by the glorious willow tree. And uh, we're here to take a, a deeper look on especially our relationship, our human beings' relationship to the spirits of nature, spirits and beings and powers of nature. And uh, as we hear about them in examples from uh, the, the mythical poems and the sagas, uh, do you remember here when uh, we heard about the, the poem of uh, Völu Spor, um, what was it, the prophecy of the seeress? In the very first verse of that one, she chants uh, something like, uh, I remember the Jotnir, the earliest borns, those who fostered me so long ago. And there we have this experienced, more or less human being, who is t telling us that she was fostered by the Jotnir, the giants, those who are the earliest born. Um, and there is so much in these few lines because uh, foster here is deemed to mean um, that, that it's both this thing of bringing her up but also teaching her, initiating her. And uh, so, so this tells us something about the giants, the Jotnir, the Thors, is that both they are the oldest and that they are very wise. And sometimes uh, there are also stories about the gods going to the giants for special insight and special wisdom that they want. Uh, in this case, it's been the wisdom and the knowledge that she needed. Um, now, there is, uh, she's not the only one that we hear about. There is also a short mentioning about uh, a man, or most of his life he was a man anyway, Bard in, uh, in Iceland. And it is said that he was brought up by and fostered uh, by uh, the very uh, Dovra old man, uh, we call him Dovra Gupen, um, the old one, in, uh, the, the old giant in the Dovra mountain in Norway, uh, a very well-known uh, <laughs> grand, grand um, figure in the, in, the, in the mythology. And so this also tells that the Dovra giant, uh, Jotten, he was, uh, he was ready to take in a, a human foster son and teach him and then uh, s uh, educate him. And then Bart went on to live in Iceland and eventually moved away from human beings. But, but these uh, stories tell us something about the, the should we say, the characteristics or, or the personalities or, or the, the being of, of Jotnar, the, the oldest one, and they are wise. And sometimes we get into conflict with them because their agenda, their concern is not the same as our agenda and our concern. We can get back to that when we talk about our spirit, uh, should we say, relationships of today. Um, this was just very short to say something about giants. Uh, it's not until in, 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 the, in Snorra Sturlason's uh, works that we really see, she would say, giants uh, being put into boxes, uh, the, w the polarization between good and bad, and they end in the bad one. Uh, and also Snorra Storlason, he, 
he makes his, um, should we say, systems out of them that are not so clear in the earlier mythical uh, poems. For example, that in the in the earlier view we hear about the frost giants, and then uh, Snorri Sturluson he invents a fire giant, Muspel, um, so that he has a nice polarity, because that was one of his agenda. I'm getting sidetracked here. Now, back back to our relationship with the with the nature of beings. Now, the giants were not the only ones who also were known to be wise. Uh, we could talk about dwarves, and uh, there is this uh, story in it, it's it's called Alvis Mall, where in fact it's it's one night that the god Thor is almost in a competition of knowledge with um, a dwarf called Alvis, meaning all wise. There you have it uh, about who. Thor is questioning him about he knows enough to be worthy to be his to marry his daughter, I think it is. And Alvis he gets so eager into demonstrating everything he, he knows and that he is worthy that he forgets one thing. That is to uh, to watch how the daylight is coming creeping. And it is at the time where the sun comes over the horizon, there uh, Alvis turns into a stone because that's his day uh, way of being. Now we're going to hear about another stone dweller or stone being. And this is a very important story for us here. I, I feel it's like a key uh, story um, for teaching about relationships. And we are in Vattenstall in Iceland in around 980 and there is a farmer called Kotran and he has pretty good luck with his cattle and, and his, his farming uh, because he has a special relationship with a being who is living in a big and beautiful stone quite close to his farm. Kotran he calls that that rock dweller or what we could call for uh, his spa mother his his uh, soothsaying his spa man but sometimes he also calls him his or mad meaning or meaning yield uh, crop harvest so it's something about uh, fertility and again mother man so we have like the harvest man and the spa man in one and the same so this stone dweller here, uh, he takes care of both knowledge and fertility, prosperity. In Kotran's own words, it sounds, uh, Kotran says um, about the sparman, he tells me much that I, I, uh, that's useful for me to hear. And he uh, takes care of my cattle. He advises me both about what I should do and what I should avoid to do. And uh, this has brought much luck. So you know, he says something about this has going on for a long time. So I have great trust in him and therefore I have uh, worshipped him for a long time. Now, how does, how do they communicate? What's the dialogue between them? Uh, when the, the spa man there gives Kutran his good advice, it happens in when Kutran is asleep in his nightly dreams. And uh, that's, she would say, the one part of the relationship. And the other one is then that Kutran, it is not said specifically, uh, only in the, in the word Dürkut, uh, worshipped, that he is probably showing his... Uh, his thankfulness by bringing food offerings to the spa mother, to the stone dweller, probably left close by that stone. In other stories, of the same area, uh, it's told of other people who had other a close relationship with land vetir or whatever they were called, that they would bring their food offerings uh, uh, to um, a waterfall. Or, or to a tree. 
in any case, we have here uh, a, a good neighbor relationship between the farmer and the stone dweller that we may call a landwette or something that results in that he has good results with his farming and his cattle. Nevertheless, nevertheless, we are in, the, in, in a year where um, there is a bishop who's on a, on a mission, we could say. He, he's traveling around uh, missionizing uh, in, in Iceland and uh, uh, it, it just so happens that Kodran let himself get talked into that the bishop, who has heard about his bar mother, uh, the bishop uh, pours holy water on the stone, uh, which is the home of the of the uh, uh, of the land there. And to to the bar mother living in the stone, it's it feels like having boiling water poured over him. He comes complaining to Kutran in his dreams and uh, well the whole thing results in that the, both the Veti and his family leaves. So the good neighbor relationships are destroyed there. Now the bishop who poured the holy water, he has a very different look in the situation. He, has, he sees, the, he even says, he calls that the stone dweller for a devil, a devil that should be expelled. And uh, in this case here, it results in, in ruining the good relations between uh, a human and a land spirit. So this is like almost a signature story uh, that tells us about exactly what, uh, what the mission of, of, the, of the church uh, people were they they really saw uh, the nature spirits as at least something that human beings should not have in, in uh, have these relationships with that was um, very unchristian and and so they did their best to um, to dispel um, dispel the, the the land spirits and demonize them this uh, began there around year thousand earlier in, in the, on the English Isles or what's the British Isles. Uh, and it's, it did result in that officially the view of, of humans' uh, relations with um, the nature spirits turned into being that the, the spirits, the la nature spirits were something we should be afraid of and keep our distance to. Um, then sometimes, for example, in Denmark, that some of the spirits that before were called vetir were now called trolls, and and it getting more and more horrible to look at, at least in our imaginations. Uh, another way of belittling um, some of the nature spirits w was very literal. For example when we hear about, in the earlier times, uh, the elves, Alfar, and dwarves, they were not seen as tiny little small people nor, or fairies. That's something that has happened, uh, which will be recognized by maybe many of you in your own local um, folk tradition. So that's a way of belittling the spirits also. Uh, at the same time, which if we think here, I just need to put this, uh, should we say, perspective into this, into this story. At the same time, as we can say that uh, society as such got Christian and a lot of uh, farmers, uh, if I can take Denmark as a, a pretty good example, uh, if we get up into the 15th, 16th, cent 17th century, there would be, um, should we say, the country, uh, um, the population, the peasants uh, may very, very well perceive themselves as good Christians. And at the same time, they have a parallel tradition where they keep up the good neighbor relations with the land spirits, those who have in their hands, you know, who will take care of the fertility and prosperity of your farm. And that was done a lot by 
gifts by offerings. Um, yeah, in it's it's less like uh, some of those uh, land spirits moved even closer to our houses, and in Sweden, for example, uh, some one of, of one species of these land vetier is called a tomte. That is both the word for the ground that a, a house is built on, but it is, it's also that, uh, should we say, prosperity given spirit that people keep a good relationship to. So much that I think up in, in the 17th century or something, um, it was complained from the church how people were still keeping the tomte as a house god. So here again we puncture the, the divisions between what we call what, of what kind we can, what boxes or categories we can put in the whole fantastic spirit world. Um, there was also, there's also been another way that some of you may even have experienced yourself firsthand in if you have come to tell or have heard about um, people dealing with, having visions of, having relations with nature spirits that other people will call that superstition. And uh, this is a rem remarkable word. Uh, it, it means, this, I think, the same in a lot of languages, super stitio, something that stands over, I think it more or less means, from an older belief, is literally. But the way it's being used is to say that if, if I say that I go out and, and talk with the being uh, that's in that willow tree and we have discussions and it, it gives me good advice, then there's bound to be some people who say that I'm superstitious or that's a superstition, meaning that that's not true. That's not real spirituality. And I first really met that word when I was a teenager and I was devouring everything I could find about um, history and prehistory, especially in Scandinavian. Well, I never stopped, did I? Um, but anyway, the, the author, in fact, was explaining how the word superstition is, there's no information in it. It's just a judgment of another, other people's belief that I don't think is worth, as worthy as my belief, especially, no, I won't go further with that, but, and when that dawned on me, I thought that word is totally superfluous. It doesn't, it, there's no information in it. It doesn't help me. I don't need it in my vocabulary and I threw it out and I was 17. So, but there you have it. If we come back to Kodran, and, and his companion over there in a, in a big, beautiful stone. Kodran didn't call, uh, call him a landvete, or a troll, or a rock dweller, or a bear buoy, or anything. He called him the names that grew out of their first-hand special relationship. Spore man, uh, spore man and uh, harvest man. And I think that's a very good, should we say, lesson for us that not to pay so much attention to, to the different categories or, or of, of spirits, but go after our first-hand uh, experience together with them, face to face, and trusting that experience. And then not care about what other people will call it. Uh, this way is, should we say, have more um, animistic traits, uh, which is also the way of dealing with spirits and nature spirits that we do in, in shamanic traditions all over the world. And that I think we will go home and hear more about. Now let us look at what all we've heard of so far today, what that means for uh, our um, shamanic seder uh, work today. Uh, what, what does that tell us about 
what to, to hold in, in, in our mind, in, in focus, in our relationships to the spirits we meet in, um, in the Seda work in a, a, in a broader sense. And to, to use like a, a one word, I'd introduce this thing about anima, an, an animistic approach to, to our relationships to the spirits. And uh, I think that's one of the best basic things to start with. And I should just say about animism very shortly uh, is that uh, you could say it's, it's a worldview that consider that everything is alive. And also with some kind, uh, the other kind, the everybody's, everybody having their own personality and their own uh, desire in this world. And that we're all dependent and therefore we also need to cooperate. And so, in a way, you could say it's it's sometimes called a religion, but in a, in a, at least when I was young, then the scholars would say that it is this belief or uh, that uh, that rock or that tree is is alive and has a soul and a spirit. And there is a newer uh, academic approach to a great ongoing discussion about animism, because that's the word we have to use. In earlier research, or what was available when I was young, then it's, it was mostly emphasized that animism was the belief that that stone, that rock, or that tree was alive and had a spirit. Whereas um, the, the newer ongoing, a great discussion around what animism could cover, that's more in, in harmony, what all the many indigenous cultures that has their kind of local uh, variation of uh, a mystic worldview, how they see it and how also I believe that we have practiced it here. And what also seems like very much in harmony how, how I experience the world. And this sort of newer take on animism says that it's not so important if you believe, believe that that rock is alive. What matters is how you behave uh, together with that rock or, or that forest. Um, in, uh, with that, how, it's more important how you move in the world together with all your more than other than human relations. So, um, so that leads us sort of back to that this the exchange, the dialogue, the, the recipro uh, reciprocity I think it's called, between uh, all the other beings and, and me as a human being. Um, that that's what the important part is, that we are working together in friendship. And, and this is the leading principle for me in my shamanic work, including the Seda. And, and I have uh, experienced it to be very beneficial, very useful. Um, very fruitful. So if we could pin that out, be a little more specific, um, and in, in shamanic work, what, what is very important to deal in a decent way with the spirits, and in a way that's also good for that, that you can do some useful work, is that you first and foremost, that you have a clear intent a clear formulated mission or purpose for the ritual that you're going to do or the say that you want to do, the piece of work you want to do. And, uh, and we had some, they could be rather simple, uh, some of the examples that I, I keep returning to as sort of a, as a red thread is Suri Sund Fylir. Her intent was to bring the fish back in that fjord with the help of those gods and spirits that she could uh, invite and who would listen for her call and come and help her. Because alone you can't do such a thing. You only can do the, you can only do these things together with a lot of spirit power or nature power. Um, and then there has, uh, there has been this other example of, of Thorbjörg who, who apparently 
her intent was to get knowledge about when would this disease stop, when would the barrenness end and fruitfulness return. Um, today, there could be uh, an intent as a, um, a gathering and sending um, empowerment, uh, power to a certain new work project, or uh, um, gather and send healing to a wounded uh, uh, corner of a forest, or a house, or a family, or a person. Um, it's, it's important here with intention is that you're not trying to control anybody or anything. It's, it's, that's where it can... We had examples from the sagas uh, where, um, where Seder was used as a weapon in conflict. But if you use something as a weapon, you need to expect that somebody fights back. And so that's not a way I would make recommend unless you're ready for battle and want that. Um, so controlling is also, uh, I'm saying that we really try not to control anybody. That includes that we do not try to heal or change somebody who hasn't asked for it. These are basic shamanic principles to work from. And... Um, and even before I say more about it, I will just remind you that the um, a, a Scandinavian Center for Shamanic Study, that's the studies that I'm part of, we've just renewed, uh, renewed our website and it now also includes some really good uh, um, texts about how to work with the spirits, how to learn to uh, phrase an intent how to make sure that your ethic is, is okay uh, and don't, should say, get you into trouble because you are doing things where you had no business. Um, and so I would invite you to, to go there uh, and uh, look under these segments. And also, um, if you want to learn more about uh, animism in, an, in a Nordic uh, context, I really recommend um, the whole greater project of uh, Rune Jarnø um, that you'll find both on website and YouTube uh, channel and all kinds of other things under nordicanimism.com. Yeah, back to um, our relationship to the spirits here and now in our shamanic world. Um, this thing of not trying to control or not trying to push your will through um, this, this is also a, a basic leading principle. Um, it includes that you do not try to, should we say, decide from your own desire that I want that God to come for my topic here or that uh, spirit or whatever. And instead you ask for help for what it, whatever you invite, those that will help you with the project you have just pronounced with a clear intent, you invite them to come, those who, who want to help you. And then whoever want to do that are welcome. There's a, there's a great um, fairy tale that tell about all the trouble you can get into if you try to control which spirits are welcome and which ones are not. It's the story of the Sleeping Beauty, um, where they wanted to exclude um, the 13th fairy. Whenever I have experienced, or rather, should we say, I have heard about that people have had problems uh, and scary, uh, very um, uncomfortable experiences, um, I, uh, I, could, I can always, should we say, lead it back to that either they have had uh, no intent or very, um, should we say, dub, uh, unclear intent that where the spirit might take you on your word, even though you thought you meant something else, uh, or if the people have tried to control through their seder. And, uh, and when people have had these problems, that have led to often two things. 
Uh, one is to think that those spirits that I met out there in that, they were bad. They were probably evil. Uh, or I'll, I'll never work with, uh, I'll stay away with that. Um, we can come back to that. Uh, and also asking for how do I protect myself in Seder. And again, I will say if you don't try to control, if you have a, f a, a clear intent and, and a fair one, um, where you are not messing with something that's none of your business, uh, then we can, I can trust that, that, who, that if I invite whoever want to help me with this project, I welcome. I can trust that. And then I don't need to protect myself against, uh, against somebody. Um, again, it's like protection puts up a wall between me and the world and the spirits. It's, and, and I think that basically shamanic work, it rests upon connection and community with the spirits. So regarding protection, uh, I can say that so far I have never felt the need to use it. Uh, and I believe that if, if you follow these basic principles of intent and uh, inviting, and, uh, and see yourself uh, basically as an apprentice to the spirits, um, then there's no need for protection. Um, this thing about the, the people who were scared, there, there were some stories about they had been out and, and, and uh, working with some land uh, spirits, and that's where they ran into this trouble. And, and that has strengthened for some this idea that the land spirits, the spirits of the middle world of nature, are some that are uh, maybe not so easy to uh, work together with. It has led to that uh, some schools, uh, some shamanic schools, also teach that, um, it's said in a little different way, it's said this, that you should only work with compassionate spirits uh, in the same breath, meaning that nature spirits are not compassionate. Um, and you should only work with sentient uh, beings in order to feel safe. Uh, and also here implying that it has been better to to work with spirits uh, from the upper world, or so realms and the lower, rather than here where we live in, in nature. Um, from an animistic point of view, then the whole idea about saying that some beings are sentient and others are not, it falls away as irrelevant when you think that like everybody's alive and so-called sentient. Yeah, I, I, we never, I never really heard the word until uh, a few years ago. Um, now, if you could also th think uh, the compassionate thing um, is, I I would again return to to let us really understand that in a shamanic way. If we return again to look at how we could relate to great giant forces like. Uh, the north wind or, or a huge uh, rock or um, a certain part of a, a part of a forest or the earth is that, that the great uh, or what some people would call elemental beings. Again, they're the oldest um, they have a very, should we say, long term way of looking at things and how to to um, find solutions. So they do have a different agenda and other concerns than, should we say, petty little human beings. And so sometimes we may have a conflict of interest. Um, but again, if, if you remember these basic principles and also maybe step, 
which I think in an animistic approach helps you do, step out of an anthropocentric centric, um, place of working from, then this will more then again I have not experienced problems in in this in this way. Now, if this can only be very short, and again, uh, it's this is not a shamanic course, but those principles I have taught on my uh, Seder courses for yeah many over thirty years. And so I feel they, 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 um, they've shown themselves to be solid. And when we follow those guidelines in inviting, for example, spirits for a certain seder, for a certain topic, um, and yeah, and in all our relay, also if we will go out on a solitary site in the night, in the, in the forest, if you follow those guidelines, I feel people have always gotten the help or the teaching that they they needed that maybe sometimes was not quite what they wanted and but in any case also we sometimes be surprised that the help and the teaching came from other nature beings or spirits than we had expected so that's what i feel is should we say characteristic of uh, or we could say an, an, a fruitful relationship with the spirits in modern Seda work. We offer these, this series of videos uh, with the lectures in Seda for free uh, for all to watch because we want to make this knowledge uh, more available to everybody who wants to. Uh, if, however, you feel inclined and feel that you have gained from this series and you and you can afford it and you want to, we are very uh, happy to receive uh, donations uh, of of any amount, really any amount. With and being, we are very thankful for that. Uh, the link for that uh, uh, you can see below the video. And already here we can say. Thank you very much to you, uh, each of you who have already given us donations. So thank you everybody for now and see you for the next video.